Welcome back to Living Soil Garden. Dario here and it's the 20th of June. Um, it's been the most amazing weather with a lot of sunshine and warmth but also uh, quite a bit of rain. So the garden is um, thriving, uh, looking lush and so I'll try to show you as many um, vegetables and beds as possible. So in a, mo in a moment I'll turn the camera around and you won't see much of me anymore. Um, we will be discussing a little bit uh, lettuce, um, fennel bulb, um, and, and other other crops that a few people have been asking about and then we'll have a look at the first of the summer crops tomatoes courgettes I'll show you some interesting um, green manures or cover crops for pollinator uh, attraction and a lot more so stay tuned um, to know more about these things and see the marvelous abundance that's um, that the garden is providing at this time of the year for a change this month we might start looking at the tunnel first some of you will be wondering how long before the tomatoes are ready or there is still a bit to go I'm afraid. I'll show you uh, what's going on in our tunnel uh, in the early summer. So let's turn the camera around. And here we go. So it's very uh, it's very early morning so you want the sun is quite low there is a little bit of um, shade but bear with me. Uh, so here we go. The, the the tunnel is now full of tomatoes, and at the bottom of the tomatoes you will see uh, lots of lettuce. And uh, we'll be talking about lettuce in a minute again. Uh, these are Olana, a very good Batavian varieties. So Batavians are um, a, a type of lettuce, not so much a variety, a series of varieties. Um, very many actually in this family, in this group, uh, which don't make a tight head like Kos or other would do and they they're very good for picking as a whole head but also as um, individual leaves this is a selenova instead which you can cut clean and then let let grow again um, the tomatoes so we've got different varieties here and the only ones that have start pr started producing are the Apera f1 which is a red cherry i'll show you how they're doing so this is a red plum shaped really or date shaped tomato um, and uh, they're, they're, they've been quite fast, they're really, really productive and really tasty. One of the highest bricks in trials of all the tomatoes grown in the UK. Here you see some ma marmand, um, French variety of uh, beef steak tomato. And here you can see the Salanova and how it works. I'm going to turn the brightness up. So this is just being cut a week ago and you can see quite a low cut and it can start growing again and it will produce another head soon. Now this has been cut quite low so it's producing multiple heads which is not ideal but some of these were cut a little bit higher up and you can see it here. So this was cut um, a little bit higher you can see the cut and then it's come back as a whole head you wouldn't be able to tell that this was completely cut and it's come again because it's identical to the initial head just a little bit smaller um, Okay, so let's turn the luminosity, the brightness down a little bit. Okay, so here we go again in the tunnel and uh, this is pretty much about it. We have some um, tomatoes, some, sorry, peppers and aubergines here in trays ready to go out. Uh, they were bought as very small plugs. It was a mistake really, we should have bought um, fully grown plants, but we made a mistake. So they came in trays and we had been growing them on for three three weeks so we'll be really late with peppers and aubergines hopefully they will have enough time to grow and the basil will go in place of the lettuces where the lettuces are um, and obviously the aubergines and peppers will replace the cover and it's a little bit of a mess there but we'll be getting in there this afternoon to uh, fix things you might be uh, asking or you might be wondering what's going on in in the in the sowing uh, area here uh, at this stage, uh, at this time of the year, we have some the last succession of French beans. These are bush French beans, and then we k keep growing coriander and other herbs. They, you know, especially coriander bolts uh, all the time, so we replace it um, continuously. Then we have late beetroots for the um, summer. Oh, actually, this might be perpetual spinach. Yeah, so it's a type of uh, leaf beet, and then we've got kales uh, for the autumn and winter lettuce and then we've got some um, broccoli that we'll use to replace any that were eaten by our friend the rabbit who got in and then we got more lettuce and more lettuce and more spinach pardon the 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 mess in here 
but it's been uh, quite a busy few days so things are changing fast here we got some leeks which will need to go out actually as soon as possible this is the remainder of our squash planting they've all gone in now so this will be thrown away uh, more leeks and that's pretty much it these are uh, it so these are um, uh, yarrows that Flavia is propagating and growing for uh, other projects and I think we're done in the tunnel and here we are out in the garden these flower beds are stunning now the sun is behind the tunnel so you can't see it in its full glory but um, it's uh, spectacular what Flavia has done here so many so many colors so many shades so many shapes um, and it's a continuous work of uh, replacing things like that borage there it's now uh, past its best and it's to be replaced with something else but Flavia will have something ready to put in there perennial poppies and uh, some flowers that does loads of things and it's really looking lush and abundant at this stage lots of birds in the garden as well so we have like holes everywhere because they keep um, digging for worms and you can imagine in our Nordic system there are tons of worms so they keep uh, finding uh, some and we have the beds and the paths full of um, holes made uh, by the birds I would like to start from this side this week because we usually start from the other one just to give it a bit of a change so here you can see our experimental uh, bed at the very start at the very top uh, so this bed has got at the moment some cabbages uh, here lettuces uh, onions those are bulb onions and you might just be about able to see the carrots in between French beans here and uh, Flavia has replaced all the mustards that started to go to flower with some fennel so there are fennel carrots lettuce French beans, cabbage, and that's pretty much it. So this is the um, bed that I discussed. This is one of the beds that I discussed in the previous video. So have a look at that to see the principle behind maintaining a bed like this. The idea is that we cut or harvest, pick continuously the lettuces on the side and leave the other crops, which are a little bit more uh, slow growing, uh, to benefit from that continuous pulse and disturbance. As we go down this way, uh, we see the uh, latest planting of lettuce. Uh, we're growing lettuces now in four rows on a 75 centimeter bed. Um, and you can see actually a progression. These are the newest ones. This is the second, the latest one. And then we have um, the previous one. Um, I think this has been a month. Uh, it must have been three, three weeks in the ground, but you know, more than a month uh, since when it was sowed. Um, and, and it's grown so fast we really struggle to pick it and stay on top of it we're selling 20 if no you know 40 40 kilos of lettuce actually at the, at the moment every week but still we can't we can't harvest it quick enough there are beautiful um japanese turnips here some of them have been munched but usually they're nice and clean and they make for a beautiful snack um they're under netting for cabbage root fly but actually this netting has been lifted so it's not very effective now um, but it, it's really important in the first few weeks and then it becomes gradually less important more lettuce under the plastic here there was the rye um, winter rye at green manure and now it's being covered so it's uh, been occultated and dying ready for planting some more uh, crops in there a beautiful chard and I want to show you something interesting actually this bed is a bit compacted and you can see the chard struggling so some of it has gone to flower like that one some of it is yellow some of these plants have barely grown at all look at this but in comparison look as we go away from the path how things are looking more lush up to this bed where things are really kicking now there's a lot of production some very beautiful leaves and we've been picking every week uh, quite a lot of chard uh, these are beetroot instead Beetroot need a lot of food, especially at this density, but we don't give them, give them too much because we know they perform well anyway. But in some areas, um, they're starting to need picking um, as soon as possible. But they're looking good. There's some yellow, uh, some orange, sorry, or golden beetroot, and there's some red and some Chioggia in there. And as we go down this way, we get to the first of the summer crops, which is courgettes. Now, courgettes are difficult in this climate because this is a very wet climate with cold nights right until the middle of summer really 
and so uh, it's they, they struggle they struggle with that they when they start going it's quite late and then they produce tons uh, but it takes them quite long to get to that stage and you might see here mm, a, a different a different range of uh, success with them like some look very weak like these guys here um, which were hit by slugs and also a little bit of the cold and it's a weaker variety and here we got a better stronger variety so these are we grow a, a light green one which is this one um, and then we grow a yellow one and a striped variety let's see if I can find yellow ones here we go so these are, are the yellow ones and a little bit of um, advice on growing courgettes so when you harvest them you have to watch out for some things so the obviously there's a main difference between the male flower which is this one without anything at the bottom and there's the female flower with the uh, fruit at the bottom now this is open and it will it will be impollinated today um, and then what will happen is let's see if we can find one this Let's get out of the way with my shadow. Um, here we go. So this flower has been pollinated probably. It's closed. So this is mature. Um, you can leave it a little bit more to swell at the back. But no later than tomorrow it needs to be picked even though it's so small. So it's so small because the plant is an early stage of development. So you can see this. Uh, this fruit back there. The flower is starting to... Yeah, that's it. It's dropped. So that's already a, a squash, um, a courgette that's starting to form seeds inside, believe it or not, because it's been pollinated, it's dropped its flower. So um, later on, that process will happen at a later, at when, the, when the fruit is a lot bigger, like here. This is a striped variety, and you can see that this is a lot longer, and the flower hasn't been pollinated yet, hasn't opened yet. Um, but it will be pollinated soon, and then we can pick it. So if you don't pick it when they're at that stage, uh, however small they are, the plant gets uh, as it gets to slow down because it starts to put the energy into the seed rather than producing more fruit. So it's a good idea to pick them however small they are if they've passed that phase where the flower has opened, being pollinated and starting to, to close and then um, uh, shrivel and dry up and drop. Okay, so more courgettes over here. Very little to say uh, on top of what I've just mentioned. We've got spring onions back up here so again we see these beds the compaction is acting a little bit yellowing all the leaves is really a lack of uh, nutrients nutrient uptake due to compaction we have this problem in in many beds because we are on very heavy clay and we try to add increasingly less compost every year and obviously that has an impact uh, so we broad fork and try to improve drainage by keeping the ground covered with a variety of roots and that's working but it takes a little bit of time to get optimal results this is the latest um, sowing of um, planting of uh, spring onions here we've got some red russian kale and you might have noticed that we leave the mustard to flower so that bed there which looks untidy is mustard that has gone to flower we'll leave it there uh, until we have another brassica flowering to keep food and habitat for our parasitic wasps which will take care of um, the caterpillars of the cabbage white butterfly later in the season um, these are shallots i believe and then behind there's some bulb fennel we have three beds of bulb fennel here for the summer and then we'll have an autumn and winter planting again you wouldn't normally grow fennel now but we found that with the right varieties and in this climate you can grow fennel quite successfully uh, from spring to winter um, you have to be careful what variety you grow and you know you want to keep your timings for sowing as far as possible from the uh, longest day of the year which is tomorrow okay so here we got broad beans oh gosh they've produced so much they're still cropping so heavily we struggle to, to get rid of all these broad beans they sell incredibly well in this country and uh, I'm quite happy about that because it means that people uh, appreciate their nutritional value and taste um, they've produced pff, like dozens of kilos a week we got perhaps too many beds here is the garlic finally starting to die off so we can harvest the bobs for storing we've been harvesting some beautiful uh, wet garlic which is the garlic when it hasn't dried yet and it's got much milder and sweeter flavor so quite a good seller here we got bulb onions let's see how they're doing so they haven't started bobbing yet but they're swelling up they're looking nice so i think in another month we'll have some proper onions and cabbages you've seen this in the last um 
um, video video tour and uh, this bed was doing quite poorly with cabbage root fly but we replaced a few plants and then they're doing fantastic we've been harvesting the best ones so what you see is really just a bit untidy here but look at the size of that pointed cabbage and uh, it's fantastic it's fantastic also how the cabbage with this structure funnels all the water in and then it draws it down towards the roots and a lot of plants do that they spread these leaves very wide so, the, to cover, so as to cover the ground protect it from sunlight and um, heavy rainfall and then they funnel the water at a slower pace at a slower speed towards their roots and in, under the mesh we've got some cavalonero that was attacked by a rabbit and then slugs but then we put the net on to avoid the rabbit getting in uh, we are rabbit fenced but sometimes rabbits find find ways to get under the gate or dig a hole under the fence anyway so this is a, um, an, uh, an experiment which is very successful in terms of one of the elements so the coriander bolted unfortunately I think too much stress for water because of the competition in here for water at least it was quite dry for a month or so and even more but the Chinese leaf Chinese cabbage is doing really well they're really thick they're really sorry I'm firm and, and big so very pleased with that next year we might not do it with coriander but just on its own three rows really de dense planting but they're incredibly good and it's one of my favorite vegetables especially one of my favorite leaves in salads here we've got some um, other bulb onions the red ones a variety called lilia and in front of me you see a bed of uh, spring onions and golden beetroot so here you see the beetroot at its first stage that's quite dark the sun is being a bit annoying but being so low so here you go there there you can hopefully just about make let me increase this luminosity there there you get the brightness the orange beetroot which is yellow inside and um it's a really good um it's a really good um sweet beetroot which doesn't have the um earthy flavor of the red beetroots but it's incredibly incredibly sweet so it's really good for roasting and other other places where you wouldn't want that strong healthy um, taste of the red beetroot also it doesn't bleed which some people might find is an advantage okay let's go behind here in passing i'll show you this um, willow how it's <laughs> going we, pr we keep pruning it we pruned it a couple of times but it keeps growing so fast and so well it's uh, one of those um uh, one of those plants that you can use to pulse your system as we said in the previous in the previous video and by pulsing i mean that by disturbing it by pruning it you give a humph you give a boost a hormonal boost to the plants which are nearby now it's very dark under there but there is let me see if i can show you there is uh, there are herbs under here so there is some uh, rosemary some oregano some sage down there and even though they're in, the, they're in the shade and next to a very thirsty plant like willow if you keep pulsing the willow as i said if you keep disturbing it and pruning it they actually benefit from the presence of the willow rather than uh, being deterred being um, harmed by it okay so let's go back to the top you see that the the levels of light change so much i should put my camera on auto but never mind uh, so you see here the thyme which is flowering and uh, here it's a bit untied there's a lot of weeds that need to come out but I don't pay too much attention to this bit um, here where my shadow is at the moment you can see how we grow uh, just about to see but there are carrots in the middle and um, and cabbages on the side and this has been a quite fruitful experiment you can see more of it here <clears throat> let's have a look so you can see the carrots in the middle and the broccoli on the side and we've been doing it with large brassicas under netting the netting protects both the carrot from the carrot fly and the cabbages uh, broccoli from rabbits and flea beetle and uh, cabbage white butterfly if needed so it's quite a nice um, combination and interplanting that works really well over here we have beds that have been always very problematic nothing seemed to grow in here slowly after a bit of chicken manure organic chicken manure and um, a round of uh, green manures which is cover crops um, that we left on the ground covered with plastic and uh, now we planted uh, a crop of lettuce which was very slow to start but now it's doing okay 
and we'll pick four heads mostly. And then we have parsley. Parsley has done really well, but parsley is tricky because it doesn't like compacted soils. It's again another dry climate crop, and so you can see it here lack of phosphorus due to lack of oxygen really. So when the oxygen is lacking because of compaction, phosphorus is not taken up anymore and you get yellow reddish um, coloration in the leaves and the plant starts to die uh, slowly. And so this is uh, some more lettuce, beautiful varieties in here. I'm not going to go through the varieties so much but I'll show you in a minute how we pick the lettuce. So this is um, uh, red deer tongue, I think, from Vital Seeds in uh, in Devon. Uh, here you see some chard that had gone to flower. We we didn't we never got round to actually cleaning clearing it in time, and it was um, sh shading, but also kind of flopping over the lettuce. So we um, crimped, we removed, you know, essentially we pulled it up, we cut it, and left it there until we didn't find the time to get rid of it and put it in the compost. That's a good strategy as well. If you have a dry day. You cut them down, you let them dry, and then you put them in the compost. It's a lot less weight to carry because the water evaporates and, you know, most of the plant is fiber and water. Uh, and so if you get rid of the water element at the end of today, if it stays sunny and windy as it is, I'll be carrying a lot less weight than I would if I were to do it uh, as soon as picked, as soon as cut. More lettuce over here, and more chard that was just, a, just cut. Look at this beautiful Olana here. It's it's it makes it makes me stress a little bit because we need to get these out as soon as possible. Otherwise, it'll be a waste. Really, they they're ready to go. There's no point picking this for salad bags. In terms of the outer leaves, they really need to go as a whole head because they're so beautiful and so dense, and the leaves are so big. Here we have Marvel of Four Season, um, which is another beautiful one, and only a few are bolting but there'll be it, it will be uh, lettuce flowering time soon so we'll have to replace a few beds um, as they flower over here you see another uh, experiment let's see if my shadow gets out of the way if i turn this way there we go so um another interplanting combination radishes down the middle and broccoli now the radishes are way too dense but they were planted during a course and so you know course participants were very keen to get as many seeds in there as possible also there were 12 people doing one bed which is a bit too many um, per square meter but per, per linear meter in this case but it did work nicely uh, even though the radishes will take forever to to swell up they'll, they'll be a good crop and again the net protects both uh, the broccoli and the radish the radish mainly from the flea beetle which has been a bit annoying uh, in the last uh, few weeks um, this is a, a carpet of uh, beetroot and broccoli and the broccoli uh, were attacked again okay so first of all there are carrots down the middle they're growing okay they'll be sh shaded now so i don't know how much growth they'll put uh, on at the moment but I'm, I'm sure as we start picking the broccoli and removing the lower leaves they, they'll slowly catch up and here we've got some broccoli heads again not a lot of light but hopefully you can see the broccoli calabrese head this is bell star f1 uh, starting to uh, starting to form and um, this gives you also an idea of how vegetable beds should look like really um, have a look at how dense that is there's no soil exposed and that's what should happen as soon as the soil gets exposed uh, even if it's mulch with compost sooner or later you get cracking and you get problems you get um, weeds coming in you see this is a really good ex example actually these plants had gone to flower the chard so they were vertical and uh, and when they got, get quite tall they let light in light in because they're vertical and they become a little bit like uh, pillars like uh, um, they, they don't create so much shadow they don't cover with their with their rosette of leaves the ground and so the ground gets exposed for for a month or so um, before we get round to removing them and transplanting something else and it starts to crack um, and uh, you can see it really well here actually when soil cracks it's a sign that it's too exposed and you see weeds coming in you know this is one of the few beds where we have weed pressure and you can see rose bay willow herb um, and um, and some plantain and some other bits here or there um, and and um, some creeping buttercup here as well and you know whereas if you look in a bed like this it's all covered so the, the weeds don't have any work to do and there's even in the space that's empty there there is no no weed pressure at all so that gives you an idea of why it's so important to keep the soil covered with mulch and living plants 
uh, both of them. Look at this beautiful broad bean. This is uh, Sutton, a dwarf variety planted in spring. So the previous stuff, the previous guys that I showed you earlier were um, some autumn planted aqua dolce. So that's a variety that's planted in autumn, in November, and then you pick in spring, late spring, early summer. And these ones we planted in spring. It's a very late succession, actually. Uh, this succession was planted you know it must have been in, in the late April so usually you don't really sow and transplant you so you don't transplant a broad beans that late but they're doing well this is even later these guys here so they are uh, still in a flowering stage but some of the pods are starting to form there so you know we'll have a very long broad bean season this year lots of picking which is actually very time consuming but you know it pays well and it's a beautiful crop, very nutritious, so we're happy to provide, to supply to our customers and friends. And here we go into the pea jungle. It's very hard to show it really on camera, but this is <laughs> majestic. They've, they've grown so well peas this year. Um, in here, I need to constantly add string to keep them tidy. Otherwise, you can barely get in here. And we have so many beautiful varieties. These guys were a bit disappointing. I hope you can see them. Let's put them in the light. So this is a, a variety of Monstu. Uh, I can't remember the name, but it's a German variety, which also becomes a podding pea. So you can harvest the pods in. Uh, the, sorry, the seeds, the peas inside if you let it mature. They're already forming, so it's not too bad. Uh, but it's very fibrous as a Monstu. It's very hard to eat it as a, as a Monstu. So it's really for peas rather than for pods. And here we've got the green munch too this is oregon getting quite big but still i'm not going to eat on camera i'm not going to eat here but there, there's only one string so you can eat it with that string and it's not you know, it's not going to stay in your mouth you can eat it as it is roger loves this i don't know where he's gone roger i'll give it to him when he comes um and at the bottom here we've got some beautiful broad beans i'll pull one just to give you an idea actually that's difficult to pull it out to the clump. There we go. So this is a Kyoja bitter that came from under the peas. Look at the, at the leaves as well, even though they were in the shade. Fantastic combination, peas and beetroot. And um, also we've got the sugar snaps, which are my favorite, favorite variety, favorite thing to eat as a snack in the garden ever. And they are Cascadia. So this is, looks big for a sugar snap, but it's got virtually no string at this stage. So you can either pod it, so open it and eat the piece inside, or eat this whole thing. And it's so juicy, so so nice, so crunchy. Uh, you can eat them at this stage, when they are proper sugar snaps, but they're not as sweet, they're not as satisfying to me. So give it a go. A lot of people see this in, at the market, you know, the bigger one that I showed you earlier, like this. And they think, oh, that's too big, That's uh, that needs potting. But actually, it's good raw with the whole pod. So just give it a go. Do give it a go. Roger, come here. Roger's just come. You take your time. <laughs> I'm going to show you how he enjoys these guys. Are you in the mood for peas? Not so much today? No? Okay. Fair enough. I'll put it there. If you want it, you can get it. Oh, yes. He likes peas and broad beans. But today... You've had your grub already, right? <laughs> Good boy. Well, you'll eat it later for a snack. Okay, so we've got uh, celery here. And so you can see we had a whole bed uh, of celery that was completely wiped out by uh, slugs. And then we, we bought some plants in actually to catch up. This is the ones that survived, the big ones are the ones that survived the attack initially. And the other plants that you see here were transplanted last week from uh, plants we bought from Delfland Organics. Really good nursery. Expensive to, to, to buy plants that are organic in this country. Uh, but it might, it's worth if you're going to buy plants in uh, buying high quality, high quality seedlings. Um, okay, so here you see a perpetual spinach instead. Um, so perpetual spinach that's just been cut, and uh, that's good. Um, and over here, perpetual spinach that's gone to flower, and uh, this ones will need replacing. We'll pull them up, save any leaves that we can save. At this stage, they're more like a chart. We'll eat them ourselves, juice them, do something with them. Uh, sell a few of them, uh, but mostly uh, they'll be gone in the compost as the stems and the flowering parts are really uh, acidic and, and bitter. They're not particularly nice. Whereas uh, perpetual spinach, when there's more, 
they are a really good seller actually and very easy to pick you cut it down and it grows back within two weeks so the bit at the bottom over there grew back in in just uh, in just two weeks Let me just reduce the brightness there okay cool so here we got uh, an interplanting of lettuce and fennel this again was mostly fennel but then the slugs got in there and we replaced the lost fennels with lettuce and look at that look at the beauty of that guy um, to give you an idea this is my hand so this is very good fennel for spring we usually don't aim to have big fennels in spring because the season is quite short and then they might go to flower but this is rondo a very good variety of fennel um, so in between the fennel and the perpetual spinach we have lettuce and, and this is how we treat lettuce most of the time in our system we pick the outer leaves now you might have seen this from Charles Downing I'll show you a video um, as I'm speaking but the idea is that we pick the outer leaves and uh, we mix and match we mix a lot of um, varieties we have cos, we have uh, butter oak, but, butter, butter head, oak leaf, batavian and other type of varieties. Uh, we, we add them all together, wash them and add to it some spinach, some uh, salad kale, uh, other herbs like um, New Zealand spinach, canopodium, uh, orac uh, and, and others depending on the season, Asian greens if we are in autumn and then flowers and they go out and become the salads that you find in our salad bags um, which are so loved and sell so well on the other side here we have more brassicas we've got a lot of brassicas which you know cabbage root fly can get um, can become a bit more pressing if we don't rotate things carefully uh, so here we have again broccoli with carrots down the middle and i'll show you this is a uh, uh, I think two different varieties of cauliflowers you can see some are quite high I think this is giant snowball really big plant and some of them stay low which are the ones I prefer because they're not so susceptible to flopping in the wind uh, but they're also not as productive um, but they're still looking good look at these leaves you know, there's no sign of deficiency there's very little pest damage in the middle in this case we put some Salad turnips, beautiful snack again. Roger likes these as well, but who you know, who, who doesn't? Uh, hack rye or Tokyo turnips in this country, beautiful, beautiful variety. Uh, I'm going to come back to eat it as a snack later in the morning. So here we got uh, other cauliflowers. Some of them struggled because they were attacked by aphids. So the heads, the curds, as I should say, they're not as big. But this is actually a fairly big cauliflower no slug damage in there so this can go out this week actually and down the middle carrots again and see some more carrots in this case if they're not so tall like those guys there they um they are actually better at letting us grow carrots down the middle now, under this mesh we have radish and wild rocket now very difficult germinate very bad germination this year but mostly it's not a matter of germination but it's a matter of slugs um, you can barely see under the mesh unfortunately but I'm not going to lift it because flea beetle has already been a bit of a hassle uh, under this mesh there are carrots shall we check how well are the carrots doing uh, I keep struggling with this sun because it goes up and down okay let's have a look I'm gonna select one of the biggest of the long carrots and we'll have a look together oh this looks quite good so that's the stage of that oh this is a yellow carrot actually very long so have a look very carefully at this carrot we are no dig in heavy clay look at how long that carrot got you know forking so when they tell you you can't grow in clay you can grow no in no dig beds you know it tapers down as it goes but this is a good carrot promising to be a fantastic carrot in a couple of weeks um, what was I going to show you? Okay, so let's talk about this interplanting now. I'm going to turn the camera around and talk a little bit about it. Okay, so here we are from the other side and we can see this interplanting that I've been talking a lot about in previous videos and we finally see it work. Um, so there are French beans, dwarf French beans on the side and they're just about flowering, flowering now. Um, and then there are spring onions and shallots down the middle. And this year I also added in some carrots uh, over here you can see them there sorry there and uh, you could add 
um, beetroot in there. We did it last year and it worked really well. Um, and essentially the way this interplanting works is that the French beans uh, grow a lot and they shade out the uh, lower part of the shallots and the spring onions. But the, they have very, the, the, the latter have a very long, uh, tall leaves, so they don't seem to bother too much. Actually, it blanches their bottoms, which is something we want. It, blanch, it, blanch, it, it blanches, it makes the bulb go a little bit more white or red, depending on the colour. And um, when we remove the French beans, because they're, they've cropped, they've finished cropping, and they are winding down, they are like um, fading out, we um, let, let the roots decompose in the ground. And um, what happens essentially is that the uh, spring onions, shallots, leeks, whatever we put in the middle, get a flush of light, but also um, get a lot more nutrients by the, the decomposition of the nodules that um, the, bean, the beans produce in association with rhizobia bacteria and that contain a lot of nitrogen. So these guys are nitrogen fix fixing plants. Um, they associate with bacteria that fix nitrogen from the air and they, they put them into nodules. Now those nodules, which I've showed you in a, in a, I've shown you in a previous video, um, will be mainly used for the pods of the actual plant that's there, but some of them will remain in the roots when we remove the tops of these plants and they will become food for the plants next door. Um, after these, we'll put winter spinach on the side so we'll have another plant cover this bit of ground and the winter spinach will benefit together with the leeks shallots and spring onions beetroot or carrots whatever it is will benefit from that nitrogen being released and this is a continuously producing bed which is constantly covered by living plants and it's also renovating uh, renewing its own fertility as it goes next door we have a beautiful crop of uh, chard see how much different this is in this bed this bed is uh, one, you know, much older than the ones I showed you earlier and, you know, the size of these, these, these leaves is not comparable to the ones you saw early on, uh, earlier on. And this is down to having much better drainage here. And uh, on the trellis uh, behind um, the chard, there are the beans. And the principle here is quite similar. Uh, so the, the chard can grow low and get the light from the south here and the beans can grow uh, behind um, its shoulders and go up and produce and we can pick both without one getting in the way of the other. These are bolotti beans actually uh, which uh, we pick in one big go, well actually in two successions uh, because we, we sell them both fresh and then we use a lot of them dry for, our, for, for ourselves and, and also we sell them shelled but even though they're not particularly popular um, when they're dried because people can't uh, be asked to soak them. <laughs> Even shelling is a big deal nowadays because people are time poor, so that's fair enough. And at the top of this row of beds, there are uh, two um, two things I wanted to show you. One is Facelia. Uh, look at the, uh, the buzz of the number of bees in here. And this is a green manure or cover crop that is used to attract pollinators, suppress weeds, and it's amazing at attracting bees. They really, really love it. And hoverflies as well. So here we've got bumblebees, um, honeybees at the moment. I've seen a couple of hoverflies earlier in the morning. Um, but there's, you know, during the day, there's a continuous come and go of uh, all sorts of uh, insects that eat um, the pollen from the facilia. And here on the left-hand side, we see the bed that we discussed in the previous video. Uh, now this is um, a polyculture experimental bed where, with a very high density of planting. At the moment we have removed some of the things that were in here. Um, we have some lettuce on the side that replaced the rocket. You can see the, the uh, red oak leaf lettuce in there. The, the, the spring onions have just <laughs> dropped down because of uh, the lack of support that was provided by the mustard and the and the spinach near next door. Now, they've been sown way too densely and they were also planted incredibly densely. So they're doing okay considering that. Um, and then we have some perpetual spinach at the back and then we have some more lettuce from the previous planting. Uh, some volunteer nasturtiums there, parsley, and we will replace um, the spinach that came out of here with some more uh, lettuce soon. Uh, some volunteer calendula, now, this is an example of what we don't want in a bed like this, which is a green that was planted 
in order to pulse the system, in order to be pruned, harvested, picked, often to stimulate the slow growing plants. We don't want it to go to flower. We don't want such plants to go to flower because when they, they're flowering, they will develop seeds and in doing that, they become highly competitive. And so rather than collaborate and stimulate the slow growing plants like the spring onions, the fennels and the other things that I will show you in a minute, they start to become detrimental to their growth. And so I will remove this after this video uh, for that reason. Whereas the things that are here on the side, there's some lettuce, there's some mustard that are still not in flower. And here you can see how the fennel, hopefully you can see it even though it's dark. Let me just go a bit brighter. There you go. So you can see that there's a beautiful fennel in there. And, um, and there's also some broad beans growing nicely, some pods developing and um yeah so i need to keep moving back and forth from different brightness levels here we've got more broad beans and uh, also some beautiful red lettuce and there are turnips in there again let me just pull one that might be just easier there you go and so things are going quite well in the in terms of the um, slow growing crops that have been stimulated and even though they are much higher density than we than we would normally plant them they've grown really nicely because of that principle that we discussed in previous videos uh, this is another example of the same thing this spinach next to the facilia here uh, do uh, does need to go because it's now gone to seed and true spinach like this can be grown very successfully in the summer unless you really are on top of it because it goes to flower straight away whereas perpetual spinach which is the one we, you saw early on and this is the latest planting uh, does not bolt during the summer so it's a great crop it does flower now but then if you sow it now or transplant it now rather uh, you can do several plantings without the danger of going to flower and this bed also will be topped up with um, uh, some some other things down the middle here where we've removed um, the mustards and the and the and the kale that was in them um, and again here this is going to flower so we want to remove that because it's not going to serve as a stimulating uh, force in this bed uh, these are the flowers next to the tunnel and just to give you a feel for how beautiful the garden is in this um, in, in these days and the comfrey is another attractive plant for pollinators as well as being a great dynamic accumulator. It pulls nutrients from down below the soil profile and pulls them up, especially potassium. And then we harvest flowers, leaves and stems and put them in the compost or we make some liquid feeds with them. Now let's go down the back here. More spring onions, uh, the latest planting. This is for early, late, late summer really. And here we've got edible flowers. Let's have a look at these edible flowers. Borage, again, a highly uh, nutritious plant for uh, insects. And uh, look at the bumblebees buzzing about. Calendula, and there's some basil, more calendula, chamomile, nasturtiums. Here, lots of flowers um, that go in our salads, essentially. And the perennial beds, a lot richer this time of year. Now, this plant this bed is not planted with perennials really we're just transitioning it out from strawberries uh, and uh, we are starting to replace some things with perennial kale there's one there and there's another one there and this is the oldest perennial kale Dobinton. then we have the um, tontondin and then here jerusalem artichokes lovage has gone to flower it's a bit stressed don't know why more strawberries that we didn't manage to kill but we'll uh, we'll use them this year oca oca de peru this, uh, this is a an oxalis tuberous lem lemony tasting plant um, chinese artichokes globe artichokes producing a lot we've harvested already 15 or oh, actually 15 might be too much we have uh, at least 10 heads um, and it's been quite quite uh, productive uh, rhubarb giving another flush now the more jealousum, uh, sorry more globe artichokes and this flower the yellow one is corsonera it's got it's got an amazingly uh, an amazingly scented flower um, smells of vanilla 
and uh, the root is supposed to be really nutritious and it, it was used in Victorian times in, um, in the UK as a, as a staple food. Uh, here there's a Flavius seed, um, seed saving beds with the lettuces that she is letting go to seed and then selecting the best the seeds from the best plants and also the the french beans so i think she'll confirm it in another video hopefully but that this uh, the idea here with the beans is to let them be and a lot of them have been really destroyed by the slugs but the ones that survive will, should be the strongest ones in terms of resistance to wind and pests and then she'll keep seeds from those and in between here you see sweet corn on the side actually that uh, we're growing for cobs and some tree spinach or magenta spleen that we use in salads. Self-seeded, so, self we'll let it go because it's difficult to germinate from bought-in seeds and so it's a good thing to leave it when it pops up on its own. Um, this is New Zealand spinach. A good spinach to grow as a substitute to true spinach during the summer for the problem that I discussed earlier. So let's, uh, let's go up, I'll show you one last thing and then we will say goodbye. So now that the sun has come out you can see the flowers in their full splendour. <laughs> Quite a beautiful bed this one and with the light being um, out it, it really shows that this season is indeed abundant. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to show you with the backdrop of the raspberries there along the fence is this um, three or well, two sisters bed. All right, Rog, what's up? What are you looking for? Mmm, you want some peas? We'll have them in a minute. Um, so here we go. There are some sweet corn plants, um, some um, squash, which is supposed to grow underneath. And uh, funnily enough, uh, this was from our own compost. It wasn't very mature. It hadn't gone really hot compared to the latest batches. And so we have some volunteer purslane <laughs> tomatoes. They, they will be smothered by the, uh, by the squash anyway some magenta spleen in there there's a potato plant but it's quite funny when that happens usually it's not weeds uh, but it's really tenacious vegetable uh, or herb plants that manage to get through and um, again that's because the, the, it's highly nutritious compost and the soil is not disturbed so weed seeds are only stimulated to germinate in such conditions if they are weeds adapted to high organic matter soils and some are, you know, purslane is a weed in, in some arid climates, but it's not in the UK as much. Another area that uh, we, we don't show very often actually, because it's only been recently developed, is this one. It consists of two parts really, those new beds uh, in, at the far end uh, con have been planted with squash, uh, winter squash. And here we've got some lovely courgettes actually. These plants were not doing very well at all, but we planted them here and they're doing fantastic now. And at the back we have medicinal herbs that Flavia has been raising from seeds and from cuttings. There's Artemisia, there's lemon balm, there is Archimilla mollis. It does look really pretty actually because of the, the shapes of these plants, which are perennial and uh, quite, um, they're quite satisfying to look at because of the different heights and different leaf shapes. Um, so I'm just going to go along and show you the full range. And uh, some of them are going to flower. So this is absent. Um, what we got it was absent Artemisia, I mean mugwort. And I don't know what this guy is. I think it's a high of some of some sort. But there are different different plants. And at the back you can see more squash to try and fill up as many of the beds as possible and a few potatoes there just an experiment to cover that bit of ground we put cardboard potatoes and we're growing some potatoes um, that we don't normally actually grow for selling so it's just as an experiment um, to, 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 to cover a little bit more ground here we have motherwort um, some yarrow the alchemilla as I said and finally this squash plants struggling a little bit because they were in pots for a long time and you can see on the right hand side we're opening new ground with this plastic um, sheet uh, so we're suppressing the weeds and then we'll put compost and start our no dig method as usual a little bit more weed pressure there and you can see it's exactly where the soil has been disturbed okay so that's it folks i hope you enjoyed this tour of living soil garden 
Uh, if you've got any other questions, please let us know in the comment section. And um, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, it might be a good idea to do it because we, we do a lot of videos on other stuff as well. And hopefully we'll be doing more in the future. And uh, that's it. So I will see you in the next one, which will um, probably be towards the end of July. See you. Thank you.